Can you see it? Is it full size? Great. And you can hear me. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Emine Simsek. I am a postdoctoral researcher at Loughborough University Center for Mathematical Cognition. And in this presentation, I am going to talk about a cross-cultural study looking at factors relating to students' understanding of mathematical equivalence. Uh, we know that mathematical equivalence is a key concept in mathematics and understanding of equivalence predicts students' arithmetic and algebra learnings. However, many students have difficulty understanding this key concept, and this has shown to be a cross-cultural phenomenon. Students' conceptions of the equal sign is well documented. We know that some students define the equal sign operationally as the answer to the problem or do something simple. And we expect students to have a relational understanding of the equal sign and them to know that the equal sign signifies the sameness of the quantities on the both sides of the equal sign and to know that both sides are uh, interchangeable. Students use uh, operational and relational strategies to solve equivalence problems. And here are some examples from strategies students use to solve equivalence problems. In terms of operational strategies, which are incorrect, some students use only um, the left side of the equal sign. They calculate the, use the numbers and operations and they reach an answer and they completely ignore the right side of the equal sign. And, and in the other, some students use all the numbers and operations at the same time. And again, they reached an incorrect answer. In terms of relational strategies, some students know that uh, both sides need to be the same and they make the calculation and they reach the correct answer. But some students, use the relationships between the numbers and operations in the equation, and they reach the answer without the need for calculation using a shortcut. I will call such types of shortcuts as relational strategies in this presentation. What we know so far about factors relating to students' understanding of equivalence. Our base theory is the change resistance account and this theory suggests that excessive practice with only traditional arithmetic reinforces the development of operational patterns in students, and they struggle solving complex equations later on. What we mean by traditional arithmetic is equations which have operations on the left side and no operations on the right side. Also, we know that teacher knowledge relates to student understanding. Some intervention studies in, uh, providing teachers professional development courses with the aim of improving teachers' knowledge for teaching early algebra uh, show that there were greater gains in students' understanding of equivalence after teachers received the professional development courses. However, it's difficult to pinpoint what really matters in terms of teacher knowledge, because in those studies, um, the focus of the professional development provided to teachers were quite general. So in this study, uh, we looked at to what extent teachers' knowledge and the format of arithmetic practice in, presented in textbooks predict students' understanding of equivalence. And we conducted a cross-cultural study. Our participants were 2,760, mostly grade four students across six countries. And these countries were China, England, New Zealand, South Korea, Turkey, and the US. And also the students' teachers participated in our study. 108 teachers also participated in our study. We used convenient sampling approaches to reach our participants. In our study, students completed a mathematical equivalence assessment, and this was a paper pencil assessment and included 15 items. There were both definitions and some equation solving items. In definition items, we asked students to uh, define the equal sign and to rate some definitions of the equal sign as good or not good. And also we asked students to find missing numbers in equivalence problems. Students' answers uh, in the assessment uh, were scored for correctness. So if students provided a correct answer, they get one. Otherwise, they get zero. 
Also, teachers completed an assessment, and in teacher assessment, we ask teachers to provide possible uh, potential students correct and incorrect answer to equivalence problems. Here is an example, and we ask teachers to provide as few or as many answers as they like that they would expect year five students to give to some equivalence problems. And our coding scheme, scheme a bit, uh, was a bit complicated and we had to drop uh, some of the categories, but here um, I will present a simpler version of our coding scheme and teachers had two uh, codes in our scheme op for operational knowledge and for their relational knowledge. So simply we looked at whether teachers were able to provide uh, students relational strategies and operational strategies. We wanted to see whether teachers are aware students use of operational and relational strategies. I provided some examples from uh, a operational and a relational strategy. Uh, and if you want to know more about them, you can contact me or about coding scheme. So teachers had two different scores for their knowledge, one for operational knowledge and the other is for relational knowledge. Also, we had a textbook variable and we looked at the format of arithmetic practice as presented in the current year textbooks to calculate our textbook variable. So we looked at every page of the textbooks and we looked at where the equal sign is presented. We looked at every equations in the textbooks and we calculated the number of equations in non-traditional format first. And what we mean by non-traditional format is that the number of equations which have operations on both sides, which have operations on the right side and which have no operations at all. And then we divided this, this number by the total number of equations in the textbooks and the total number of equations included equations in non-traditional format, equations in traditional format, and um, the number of the equals bar. And this ratio changed between 0 and 1. And if the textbook variable gets closer to one, we know that the textbook provided more non-traditional equation than traditional ones. To analyze our data, uh, we used a multi-level model, multi-level structure equation modeling. We accounted for the multi-level structure of data as students were nested in the classroom. So we used a two-level model. And before running our models, first we run some measurement models to identify the latent structure of the variables, especially students' understanding of equivalence at the student and at the class level. So this is the model we came up with after we run our measurement models and identify the latent structure of the students' uh, variables for students' understanding of equals, uh, equivalence. And if you look at the uh, student level, you will see we have two latent variables, uh, one for um, students' knowledge of definitions of the equal sign and one for students' performance on equations, so their equation-solving performance. This um, two uh, components has uh, shown to be two distinct but related components of students' understanding of equivalence, so this wasn't quite surprising to have two different latent variables, and we expect them to be related after uh, we run our model and we expect that age would predict definition and equation solving. And if we look at the class level, uh, we have one latent variable at the class level uh, referring to students' overall understanding of equivalence. And we have teachers' operational and relational knowledge, two separate variables for uh, teachers' knowledge. And based on the change resistant account, we expect that textbooks relate to students' uh, overall understanding of equivalence. And based on the previous cross-cultural studies showing differences between students' performance across different countries, we also expected that there will be differences between countries' uh, students' performance across our participating countries. And we run our multi-level structure equation model to test our conceptual model. And at the student level, 
as we expected, definition and equation solving uh, related to each other, but H wasn't a significant predictor of uh, definition and equation solving. And at the class level, you will see we have teachers' relational knowledge, and it's related um, positively and significantly related to students' uh, understanding of equivalence, but teachers' operational knowledge and textbooks didn't relate to students' understanding. And to run our model, we had to choose one reference category to be able to show the main effect of country. We chose England as a reference category and we run our model. And as you can see from the figure, um, there were differences between the performance of students in England and the remaining of our sample, except for Turkey. But to explore the main effect of country in detail, we run an analysis of variance test. Also, we did some pairwise, pairwise comparisons. And as you can see from the graph, Chinese students were the highest performers and they, their performance significantly differed from their peers' performance across um, the other countries. And similarly, uh, students in our New Zealand sample were the lowest performers and their performance significantly differed from the performance of their peers uh, in the rest of the countries. There wasn't a significant difference between um, Turkey and English samples, and, but they differed significantly from the rest of the countries. And there wasn't a significant differences between students' performance in South Korea and the US, but they differed significantly from the rest of the sample. Uh, it, and now I will discuss some of our important findings. I think our most striking and important findings were was that teachers' knowledge of students' relational strategy, strategies relates to students' understanding of equivalence. So we show that teachers knowing about students' use of relational strategies matters in terms of students' understanding. However, it's difficult to talk about the direction of causations. So, so two explanations are possible. Maybe uh, teachers know these strategies and they might be teaching these strategies to students so they have a good understanding of uh, equivalence. But also maybe students have know these strategies themselves before their teacher uh, teach them. So we are not sure about the direction of causation. And although we show that this specific type of teacher knowledge is important, it's difficult to um, talk about what's happening in the classroom and why this type of knowledge is important or how this specific type of knowledge relates to student, uh, teachers' instructional decisions, whether they do something different in the classroom. So it's difficult to know what's going on in the classroom. Also, we said that we measure teachers' knowledge of their students. However, we also might be measuring teachers' content knowledge because relational strategies, teachers themselves might know about relational strategies. They don't need to learn relational strategies from their students. Also, uh, our descriptive statistics show that teachers seem to be more aware of relational strategies than uh, operational strategies. So this also shows that uh, teachers have to learn operational strategies, incorrect strategies from their students, but they might know relational strategies themselves. So this is, I think what we measure is uh, part of teachers' content knowledge in addition to their knowledge of uh, their students. And textbooks didn't relate to understanding of equivalence. This was quite surprising based on the change resistant account, but our um, textbook variable had a limited scope because it we just look at the, uh, we looked at only the format of arithmetic practice. So we didn't look at whether um, textbooks define the equal sign operationally, relationally, or, the, or they represent equations in different contexts. And also we don't really know how teachers use these textbooks in the classroom. And 
given that teachers uh, often refer to online resources, they might be using other resources too, and maybe it might be important to look at the other resources that teachers use in the classroom. And we didn't account for prior knowledge and previous textbooks. It could be said that um, maybe students develop a strong understanding of the equal uh, sign and equivalence at, the, at earlier grades, or they develop operational patterns and early grades. Maybe textbooks they use in later grades of schooling may not be that important. And we found differences between countries and uh, we replicated previous results. Although we replicated previous results, um, schools, it is important to note that schools may not be representative of their respective countries. And we used country as a general variable. So although we show that there were differences between the countries, it's difficult to say what is causing the differences between the countries. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emine. While the next person is setting up the slides, maybe we have time for a quick question, if there is one. Um. Thank you, I do have a question. That was a great talk. Um, I'm curious about the possibility that the absence of a textbook effect, could it be because the textbooks have an effect through the teachers? That is to say, the textbook may not directly affect students, but teachers' understanding may depend on the content of the textbook. And so uh, essentially the teacher effect could be masking a textbook effect. And one way to test that would be to see if, if the textbooks themselves predict teacher knowledge. Have you looked at that? Uh, we, we weren't able to test that um, because of the sample size, I think. Um, yeah, and some of the countries textbooks were mandatory and it was difficult to see there is an interaction effect between the textbooks and the teacher knowledge. So we try to, as far as I remember, we try to test this, but we weren't able to test it. But it's, it's a really good point and maybe larger cross-cultural studies can address it, I guess. Thank you. All right. Shall I begin? Yeah, just go ahead. All right. Um, well, thanks. That was a really interesting talk and nicely set up math equivalents. I kind of assumed I wouldn't have to do it, and I don't. Um, so uh, I want to start out with a video clip of a child actually explaining their solution to a math equivalence problem. And I'm hoping you can all hear this. Mm. How did you get 12 is your answer? Yeah, did five. Okay, so she's very confident in this, right? She's she's like, yep, it's five plus four plus three, and she's pointing to those add-ins, and this is absolutely the wrong answer, right? Um, so math equivalence is difficult. There are a lot of factors that affect um, how children learn this concept, and we know um, from the previous talk that teacher knowledge matters. Um, today, I'm going to kind of expand this and broaden the question to what a learner brings to the table, and also to um, tools that have been previously shown to be effective for teaching math equivalence. So specifically, I'll focus on action and gesture as two tools that can be used to teach children how to solve these problems. Um, and here I'm defining action as, um, you know, what we would think of as using manipulatives in the classroom, direct manipulation of objects where you cause change in the world, whereas gestures are produced with speech naturally. And although they don't actually cause change in the world, they do represent ideas and they seem to be very powerful for conceptual change. And while both action and gesture are effective teaching tools for mathematical equivalence, we do see some differences overall in how these tools seem to work. So some previous literature, um, both within the math equivalence and beyond, suggests that gesture leads to more flexible learning than action for children. Um, however, there's also evidence that action might be more effective for children who have less foundational knowledge coming into a concept. And this starts to hint at the importance of really considering individual differences in the learner to understand what the best um, teaching tools are going to be. So today what I'm going to do is present two studies where we began to kind of tease apart um, what a learner is bringing to the table and how this is going to affect whether they learn from action or gesture. Also considering how they're learning from a teacher doing action and gesture versus doing action and gesture themselves. 
Um, and so in study one, I'll present um, individual differences looking at children who spontaneously do or do not use gesture when explaining their solutions to math problems. And then in study two, I'll talk about different levels of knowledge and how that might relate to learning math equivalents. And in both cases, I turn to videos like the one you um, saw at the beginning to really understand um, how to sort of classify these children. So all children were asked to explain their very incorrect pretest solutions to math equivalence problems. And we were able to see what they do with their hands or in some cases do not do with their hands. So first, why might we expect that spontaneous use of gesture could matter for how a child would learn math equivalence? So I want to turn briefly to a theory that um, is about 10 years old or so at this point, um, the gesture is simulated action framework. And this framework suggests that um, gesture arises after simulation. So simulation being an embodied sense involving activation of premotor action states. And then the, the idea is that this action activation can spread to motor areas and be realized as overt gesture. Um, and so the idea with this is that really um, when we're thinking, if we have these strong sensory motoric representations of um, the information we're thinking about and then talking about, then we're more likely to gesture. Gesture. So what that might suggest is that the lack of gesture at pretest may indicate that children might have very little ability to simulate in relation to math equivalence, um, or that they have a very high natural gesture threshold, which is something else presented in this framework, that it's that some people have like uh, a lower threshold for when you would actually realize these overt gestures. And this hasn't really been explored in the gesture literature as something that could affect how people learn. But I'm going to argue that potentially it might be more difficult to learn from gesture if you don't do it naturally yourself, right? So you might simulate things in a different way. And that perhaps action would give you a much more concrete way to learn about something if you're not very good at simulating it. Um, and so for this, I will compare um, the use of action versus the use of gesture as a teaching tool. Um, I'm also going to suggest, since this theory is really about doing, uh, producing gesture, that it may be more pronounced if we see an effective gesture or action when these gestures or actions are produced by the learner rather than the teacher. And so the second factor that I'll look at in this um, experiment is, uh, do we have the teacher producing action or gesture or the student producing action and gesture? So we had 145 children in this study um, around the age of nine, and they all failed our pretest. Our pretest consist consisted of six math equivalence problems, um, three that I'll call trained because these are the types of the same format that children then receive training on um, during our instruction period. And then six, um, what we call, or three, what we call transfer problems where the format is a little bit different. And this is where we've seen um, gesture effects before where gesture leads to more flexible learning and better performance on these transfer problems. After children all failed their pretest, they were asked to explain their answers. Um, so they would have the problem written up on the board for them and then be simply asked, can you tell me how you got 13 or whatever their answer was. And for this, the sake of um, this, uh, this study, we were really just asking at pretest, do children produce any gestures when explaining these six problems? Um, then they are a gesturer. If not, they are a non-gesturer. Uh, children were trained in one of four conditions. Um, in all conditions, the speech strategy that all children produced was an equalizer strategy, so saying I want to make one side equal to the other side. And then um, they had a gesture or action strategy that was either produced by the teacher or the child. So um, for doing gesture, you can see that a child is saying, I want to make one side equal to the other side where, while holding up this V point to indicate that they need to add these two numbers together to put it into the blank. Um, doing action, uh, the, there are actually number magnetic number tiles that they grab off of the problem and then hold in the blank. And then we see the same thing, um, you know, the same strategies used, but by the teacher. So the child is producing the strategy, the teacher is either doing the grouping gesture or moving those tiles. Um, then children received a post test, and then we checked to see if this learning lasted over time, both next day and four weeks later. Um, here's the breakdown of our groups, uh, of our conditions based on the number of gesturers versus non-gesturers. And I will highlight that non-gesturers are over a third of our sample in this case, or about a third of our sample in this case. So it's a pretty large number of children who are producing um, or not producing gestures at pretest. Um, 
So focusing first just on the children who are gesturing, because we would hope that this would kind of um, replicate and extend previous literature. Um, and I'm just going to briefly say, in terms of those learning problems, we say, see very similar learning patterns for all children. But we do see better transfer after doing or seeing gesture compared to doing or seeing action. This replicates and extends prior literature, which had found this effect of gesture, but had just looked at doing. So now we're seeing these same effects if children are seeing gesture. And now I want to turn to the non gestures. Do they look the same or different? And hopefully you're thinking, I bet they look different. Otherwise, this would be a really boring talk. And indeed, they do. Um, so let's first consider learning. So what I'm going to show you is the proportion correct on the y-axis and the conditions on the x-axis. You'll see the non-gesturers, so our kind of group of interest, in the lighter gray bars. And here's what they look like for the doing conditions. So um, pattern-wise, right, it looks like these children who don't gesture at pretest are doing better on these trained problems in doing action and worse in doing gesture. Um, and it doesn't look like much is happening um, when we look at the seeing gesture and seeing action conditions. And in fact, statistically, there are no learning differences here. But if we look at transfer, we see these patterns actually become significant. So here, what we see is that, yes, there absolutely is an effect um, that's different for these children. Doing action leads to better transfer for the non-gesturers, and doing gesture leads to better transfer for the gesturers and there's nothing going on with the seeing gesture or seeing action conditions. Um, and I would argue this is the more educationally relevant piece, right? Like we're looking at transfer, can you understand um, how to solve other formats of problems and not just the format that you were trained on? And then the good news educationally is like, does this stick around? I'm not gonna spend much time on this other than to group all problems together and show you that basically if you learn you're going to retain at least a month later. It could be that if we had tested five weeks later that they don't know anything about equivalence anymore, but at least a month later, they're, they've still held on to this. Um, so this starts to give a sense that like we probably want to be, as a, um, a field, really considering these individual differences a little bit more than we have in the past, and that potentially um, this spontaneous use of gesture is an important cue for how children might learn through gesture versus action. Um, study two, I now I'm going to turn to looking at different levels of knowledge state related to math equivalence. Um, and to do this, I'm going to introduce a term that's been used in the gesture literature, but might not be so familiar um, outside of it. And that's the term of a mismatcher. So this term was originally um, sort of introduced as an idea in the late 80s as a child who produces a generally incorrect strategy in speech, um, but shows additional inconsistent knowledge in their gesture. So basically, your gesture and your speech don't match each other when you're explaining um, your solution to a problem in this case. And what this is thought to represent is cognitive conflict and how to solve a problem. Um, and it's also thought to be an indication for readiness to learn. So the idea is if you have this conflicting understanding and often what's in gesture is more correct, um, some indication that you might understand um, what the equal sign means in more of a relational sense than you're expressing in speech, um, that this is going to indicate that you're like ready to learn this concept. Um, How did you get 12? Okay, so that's the first video I showed you. And this is not a child who's mismatching, right? She is doing a gesture, a set of gestures that reflects what she's saying. She's pointing to those three add-ins. But I want you to take a look at this second child. So how did you get 12? I added five, and the four, and then the three, two. All right, so it's subtle. But this child points to the five on the other side, on the right side of the problem. She doesn't refer to it in speech. She's basically saying the same thing in speech as that first child did, but she's indicating some knowledge about that five over there. Um, that, and we have found that that's predictive of um, sort of this readiness to learn. So the idea then is that mismatchers may be able to learn from all instruction, but maybe children with less foundational knowledge might be helped more by action. So in study 2A, um, I'm going to show you data looking at um, whether or not this is the case. So we'll look at strictly learning through doing action or um, doing gesture. Um, this is a very similar procedure to what I showed you in the first study. 
Um, but then also there is this idea in the literature of concreteness fading, right? That maybe like having something more concrete and then moving to something more abstract is gonna be the best for learning. So in study 2B, um, we actually look at action training followed by gesture or gesture followed by action to see if actually combining these tools is going to be um, best for uh, uh, presumably these children with less foundational knowledge. Um, so very similar in terms of the, um, the children who were in these studies, um, their pretest explanations. Now what we're coding for is whether a child produces any mismatches on any of those six problems, um, and that would make them a mismatcher. And then, as I said, study 2A is going to be strictly doing gesture or doing action and training. Um, study 2B is going to be doing action than doing gesture or doing gesture than doing action. Um, and I am happy to get more into the design uh, if people want. Um, and then we have our post test and transfer. Um, this is the breakdown. So I will point out that we did have non gesturers in the sample and we exclude them for the purpose of this analysis because we don't have a sense of their foundational knowledge as indexed by their gesture. So um, study 2A, so here's our just action versus gesture, and I'm going to divide this up first by mismatchers and um, non-mismatchers. Um, and you can see that it looks like there might be some performance differences here. Um, gesture seems better, but for our non-mismatchers, maybe not. But it turns out that statistically, gesture leads to better overall performance than action for all of these kids, and there's not an interaction with mismatcher status. So this was a little bit surprising as we might have predicted that action would have actually been a stronger way to learn for these kids um, who have lower foundational knowledge. However, in 2B, we do see a difference coming out. So children who show readiness to learn benefit from either training type. This is our mismatchers. But we see that children who are coming in as non-mismatchers, so they don't have this readiness to learn, um, learn best from action to gesture training, right? So this really suggests this concreteness fading idea. Um, so I'm out of time, but I want to just basically summarize that I think um, what I hope these two studies have demonstrated is that it is really important to consider these individual differences. Action and gesture are very powerful tools for uh, teaching math equivalents, but we have to consider the best ways to use each of them. And I will quickly thank my collaborators, um, Caroline, for organizing this symposium, our participants, our funding, and um, I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, maybe one very quick question, if there is one, uh, if there is one, otherwise the chat might be a good option, yeah. We should move on, because I, I was like at 14 minutes and like 30 seconds or something. <laughs> Perfect, okay, thank you. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm working on a small screen right now and tag teaming uh, lots of children and a husband who's a teacher in meetings. So I apologize if I'm interrupted while I'm talking as well. Um, so um, my name is Erin Otmar. Um, I'm at Worcester Polytech Institute. Um, and I'm going to be showing um, some of the work that um, I've been doing over the last few years related to um, using technology to examine a lot of the issues that have been discussed. Um, and Liz, thank you very much for talking about gesture and action and equivalence because again, now I won't have to do that. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I think a lot of what, um, what I'm gonna be showing you today builds on a lot of this foundational work um, in gesture and action and equivalent, um, but does it in a way that is slightly different and takes a bit of a different perspective on things. Um, so um, some of this work was done um, with, um, with Jenny and Ji Yoon, who I think are here as well, and um, a whole host of other people um, who, have, who have helped kind of make this work happen. Um, and so I think, um, a little bit different than some of the studies that have been shown today. Um, my work tends to focus on middle school and high school um, and the transition to algebra. Um, and so, um, you know, the mindset is that, um, you know, algebra should be a gateway to higher level mathematics in STEM fields, but um, it, it tends to be a gatekeeper for many. Um, and my perspective on this is that um, one of the many things that makes it hard for kids um, is really kind of this simple language representation system in the abstraction of those numbers. 
Um, and it really requires students to learn how to focus both on the little rules um, and understandings of things like equivalent um, and also um, have a bigger picture at the same time about, um, about the structure um, of, um, of the larger mathematics. And so another area of this that is slightly different, but a little bit related to um, some of the things that Liz was just talking about um, is I, I'm taking um, a perceptual motor approach to thinking about equivalence um, as opposed to a strictly gesture approach. Um, and so if I use the word gesture in my presentation, I'm not talking about the gestures. Liz was just talking about, I'm talking about gesture actions um, in a technology system, um, not gesture um, in the kind of traditional psychological sense. Um, and so the approach that we take um, is that um, math is kind of a lot like chess, where you start learning rules. Over time, you acquire these perceptual routines. Um, and add, the more experience you gain with, um, with mathematics, um, the, the better you're able to kind of um, think about um, math as a system as opposed to an individual rule. Um, and so um, I'll just show very briefly um, three of the kind of conceptual concepts coming from this. Um, one is that um, a lot of work, you know, has shown that everything um, that people kind of reason about math um, as larger structures and perceptual grouping effects are pretty strong, especially related to uh, concepts of math. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our team um, and the work of, um, of my colleagues, especially uh, David Landy and Rob Goldstone have shown that spacing effects are pretty strong and we've replicated that in our work as well um, in middle school in, um, in school settings. The other thing is that, um, that learning to operate on notation involves paying attention to things. Um, and then the third piece of this, um, similar to what Liz was just saying, is this concept of action. So um, there, there's a theory that symbols are treated as physical objects in space that people can manipulate and act upon, and they react to those rules um, and constraints um, that people have. And so um, what, is, uh, what, the, what has happened over the last several years is um, a lot of the body of work that myself and my colleagues have done has focused on ways that perception, action, and cognition affect math learning, particularly um, pre-algebra concepts. And so um, we have developed a tool called Graspable Math, um, where basically the numbers, you can physically pick up and move them. Um, and they're constrained to mathematical rules. Um, and so you can see in there, you can factor and distribute by physically pulling in. Um, if you try something that's mathematically invalid, it gives you feedback that what you're trying is not um, is not valid, um, asks you to try something else. Um, it bridges to, to lots of different math concepts, um, but the general idea is that action is the mode or gesture actions are the way and the vehicle um, by which kids can explore these mathematical concepts. Um, sorry, the video is not done, so it's not letting me advance. Hold on a second, there we go. Um, so based on this idea, um, we have developed um, a game version of this for middle school students called From Here to There. Um, and so what From Here to There is, is it's essentially the Graspable Math system overlaid on a number of problems. Um, and um, kids work, um, kids move from very, very basic operations like um, basic addition all the way through um, linear equations and concepts of equivalence. Um, and so there's a number of problems in each of these levels and they progress through at their own pace. Um, but the important thing about from here to there is that we never ask them to solve. So we never ask them to come up with an answer. Instead, we start, we give them a starting state and we give them a perceptually different end state. Um, and their job is to basically transform and apply mathematical rules in the system using these gestures to match this, um, this visually different state. Um, so here, um, here is an example of from here to there. So um, there's a cup, there's lots of gestures that are built into the system. This shows how they can decompose um, six into two times three. Um, they can then, um, you know, break up any number into any mathematically um, equivalent state. Um, and then they can perform operations by tapping or combining. Um, in addition, um, you can distribute in um, and um, there's several different settings and gestures um, that, that focus around the equal sign. Um, and so one of those things is um, tapping and holding the equal sign to add to both sides or multiply by both sides. And so um, what students can do is, is explore with like a lot of different things. Anything that's mathematically valid is possible. Um, 
There's also a feature where they can drag across the equal sign, which is something that I think a lot of people are not sure. Is that a good idea? Is that not a good idea? Is action a mechanism or a vehicle to provide kind of students understanding of equivalence? Um, so in this system, um, students learn both. So they learn to do both, you know, to do, uh, to do, to do the same thing to both sides, but also to be able that um, to enable this dragging and acting um, across the equal sign and um, and kind of um, think about um, uh, like inverse operations. Um, let's see, these videos are stalling. Okay, so here's an example of the problems. I think show how um, these ideas of equivalence are not strictly procedural. So um, here's an example um, in, a, in the level on um, inverse operations where, um, where students have to understand how to transform a plus four equals a plus four into this state right here. Um, and so what a lot of students who don't have an understanding of equivalence or order of operations or inverse operations oftentimes do is they pay attention to this nine. Um, and so oftentimes the first thing that they'll do is tap and hold the equal sign and divide both sides by nine. But then there's actually no way that they can ever get to this goal state because when they then try to multiply by 10 or then multiply, try to add three, um, the structure of uh, the structure of the expressions and the equations are are fundamentally different than the goal that they're trying to get to. Um, and so um, in the game, students can reset or reattempt as many times as they want. There's hints available to them. Um, and what we do is we log all of the actions and behaviors and strategies that kids use as they solve these problems and move through and kind of look at how failure and how um, uh, productivity of strategies and efficiency of strategies relate to learning. Um, and so um, at, uh, in the beginning, um, the, my questions were really about impact. So um, do students who use from here to there or graspable math more broadly show improvement on their math understanding? Um, and this is not just math understanding of, of procedural understanding, but also includes understanding of equivalence, understanding of conceptual, um, conceptual concepts compared to normal classroom practices or other technologies. And um, this question that Liz, you talked to a little bit about was, does it help higher performing or lower performing students or knowledge? To, what role does knowledge play and how, how these, um, these actions um, and systems play out? Um, and so here's the theory of change, um, which guided the design of from here to there. Um, and um, you know, ultimately what I'm gonna show you now is from this from here to there intervention strictly to prop these proximal outcomes. But then um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that we're starting to um, explore the mechanisms behind it. Um, and so what I'm going to show you today is a is an RCT we did in uh, sixth grade about a year and a half ago, um, where um, students were randomized into two conditions. So they were randomized into from here to there or assistance, which um, for people who aren't familiar with assistance, it's an online um, homework system where um, they get um, immediate feedback um, and correctness information um, about their answers and also can request hints that guide them through it. Um, and so um, the active control of assessments was um, was selected mainly uh, for several reasons. One is it kind of uh, takes a much more um, mastery focused uh, correctness approach to um, understanding um, some of these uh, pre-algebra concepts. Um, but it also um, is one of the um, one of the strongest interventions according to What Works Clearinghouse for math in middle school. Um, and so. Um, using this as a guide is a way to have an active control um, that gives us a little more information about um, comparing from here to there to other effective interventions as opposed to just uh, business as usual instruction. Um, and so the study design, we had 475 students. Um, they were in, um, we worked with about 10 teachers in five schools um, and half were assigned to from here to there and half were assigned to problem sets. Um, they, they took a pre and post assessment and then they, they each completed four 30 minute sessions um, in the, the technology. So they either solved um, problem sets on the um, particular concepts or they progressed through the game. Um, so some of the assessments that were used um, measured algebra knowledge, um, mathematical equivalence, uh, procedural knowledge, conceptual understanding, math flexibility. We also measured math anxiety. Um, and what you can see is we used a whole host of items to kind of measure a lot of those uh, constructs that um, or, or existing measures that tend to reflect um, seventh and eighth grade math concepts, particularly related to um, understanding of 
um, equivalence, but also um, kind of some of these uh, pre-algebraic notation concepts. Um, and so what we found um, is that students in both technologies learned after both interventions. And so um, it gives us a little bit of this question of, well, if both students learned, then what is your baseline? What would have happened if you had a business as usual? Um, but once we accounted for um, their prior level of knowledge and some of the demographics in applied um, hierarchical models, we actually found an advantage of from here to there over assessments. Um, the Hedges G was 0.16. Um, and um, when we translated this to the What Works Clearinghouse Improvement Index, um, that was 6.4. So what this means for people who aren't familiar is that if a student or a teacher were to give um, their students the um, from here to there intervention, um, they could expect that their that their um, performance would improve approximately 6.4 percentage points above um, the average um, effective intervention that they would otherwise use in this case um, compared to assessments. Um, and so while it's not hu a huge effect, I think the fact that this was just after a two hour intervention and it was in comparison to something that already has really strong effects, um, it indicates that there really is something going on in students' conceptual understanding. Um, and so what, um, what we're doing right now um, is we're doing a larger efficacy study exploring the impact of from here to there compared to other conditions. So we're, we're replicating the hints and immediate feedback condition. We're also looking at delayed feedback to look at um, at the um, whether or not the, the learning um, varies depending on if kids get this immediate feedback and hints um, or not. And we're also comparing it to Dragon Box, which is a commercially available app um, that um, is also based in perceptual learning concepts, um, but actually hides the math and does not reveal the, um, the notation or numbers from the start. So their approach is much more of a start super uh, concrete and um, fade into, into algebraic notation, whereas from here to there starts right from the start um, with math notation. Um, doing a large scale efficacy study during COVID has been really interesting. Um, we, um, we, the idea is that it's 12 um, sessions across the whole entire school year. Um, it's within student randomization um, with these four conditions, which is the only saving grace to actually making this happen this year. Um, we have 4,000 seventh grade students, 55 teachers, 150 classrooms, and 11 schools in a single district. Um, the complexity is, is that um, some students are fully asynchronous remote, and then some students are full in person 100% every day. And so what we have is actually not four conditions, but eight conditions. Um, and we also have found that um, there's a significant amount of movement of kids um, from schools, within schools, between schools, within classrooms, within teachers. Um, and so um, stay tuned for what we actually are able to understand. Um, but again, I think these questions are, does this improve student achievement and growth? Um, because we're monitoring this across the whole school year, we'll really be able to answer our growth modeling questions that we've never been able to do before. Um, and then these questions about whether or not it's more effective for children. So what do we know so far? Um, again, we're have, um, this was the data from August through December, um, where they, um, they did four, uh, sorry, they did six sessions within from here to there or assessments um, or Dragon Box, um, and then they did a pre and a mid assessment. Um, and what we're seeing again is on average, um, all kids are learning in all conditions, which is great news, especially during COVID. Um, the, the interesting thing, um, what we see is that the learning gains are slightly bigger for kids in the two game-based conditions than the, than the assessments condition. But again, I'm not making any claims right now because this is, this is baseline. We're only looking at means. We haven't run models yet because we're, you know, we're just not there yet. Um, but What's also interesting for people who are doing work um, in in real classrooms right now, currently, um, the kids who are at home, um, there's something weird going on. Um, my guess is that they're getting help or they're cheating or using calculators or solvers or something because their performance is actually twice as high as the kids who are in school, um, even though they're randomized. And so there's something really weird going on there. So. As of right now, we're likely going to have to break our kids into at home versus not at home to be able to make any claims about this, but um, that's where we are. Um, but the good news is, is what we saw in the sixth, you know, sixth and seventh grade sample, it seems like the same thing's happening after 
um, about the same amount of intervention. I've also done this with elementary school students and the effect sizes were comparable. Um, and so the questions then become, is this the dynamics? Is this the action? Is th what is this? What's happening? What's working? Um, and so that's where these questions of mechanism come in. Um, and so um, real quickly, because I want to make sure everyone else has time, but um, one system, um, one benefit of the technology is that it records all of their actions, all of their gestures, all of their strategies, all of their steps. Um, and then we're able to actually utilize um, kind of computer science data visualization analytics methods to understand some of the strategies that kids use as they move through to be able to see like, is this perception, is this action, is this errors related to equivalence, what is this? Um, and so um, we've done quite a bit of work on looking at some of the different metrics um, that the system gives us, particularly related to how they move through, um, how many times they reset, where the errors are, how much time they spend, where are they pausing, and what's the variability in individual differences in strategy choice. Um, and so real quick, I'll just click through so you can see the four profiles. What we're seeing is that kids are moving through the game at very, very different paces. Um, they're using extremely different behaviors. So in this case, there's a bunch of kids that are reattempting and retrying multiple times. So um, whereas these kids like almost never reset and retry um, and they're moving very, very slowly through the game. And so one of the things we're trying to do now is look at how these different profiles map onto their learning gains. What we can see is these are likely the high knowledge kids who are moving really quickly through the game. Of course, they have higher, higher end knowledge. Um, but what's really interesting are, is this group right here. And so what we can see is kids who are, we say we call slow and steady, who start at, um, have super high low levels of knowledge coming in um, of these conceptual um, ideas, um, but really persist and fail a lot in the system and reset and retry and really spend the time engaging with the system. They're actually catching up to the kids who start um, in the middle group. Um, whereas the kids who don't have those behaviors of kind of productive failure and resetting and retrying, they're really not gaining that much at all. Um, and so to me, that, that kind of brings this indication of, well, maybe it is this action and, 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 and feedback within, within these dynamic environments that um, is really giving students experiences to play with these ideas of equivalence or the, play with these ideas of um, of kind of conceptual and procedural mathematics that on paper, they don't have those constraints. Um, because the system gives them feedback, immediately when they try something that's invalid, it doesn't let them progress through, is that really the mechanism that's, that's happening? So, um, so this just shows, again, those kids that are resetting and retrying more are actually catching up to the intermediate kids. Um, Whereas you know there's there's differences in post test scores between all of the other the other profiles. Um, so anyway, thank you for um, for listening. I'm happy to answer questions. But again, you know this work is done by by a huge large number of people, and so um, I want to make sure that um, you know that they're acknowledged for a lot of the work that they've done in building the systems and conducting the research. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. Can I just direct you to the chat for questions so we can um, move on with Caroline, maybe? Of course. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, great. Here we go. I will speed through. Um, so we're looking at the unique predictive role of concrete versus abstract understanding of math equivalence here. Um, so I don't need to talk about what math equivalence is. Um, skip right by that. But we know that it's, it's important. Um, so my colleagues and I have shown that children's understanding of math equivalence in second grade predicts their math achievement in third grade. Um, and that's also controlling for IQ, gender, SES, and also their prior math achievement. Um, and it's not only that a correct understanding is helpful for math achievement um, later on, it's that uh, children's like entrenchment in traditional arithmetic, arithmetic strategies is not helpful um, for later math achievement. Um, along those lines, I've also demonstrated in other work that specific misconceptions can act as barriers to learning of early algebra. Um, Matthews and Fuchs um, have, have demonstrated that second graders equal sign knowledge predicts their fourth grade algebra competence. 
And more recently, my colleagues and I have shown that earlier understanding of math equivalence in elementary school predicts their algebra readiness in middle school. Um, so just to briefly uh, talk about that study, this is currently under review. Um, in this graph, you'll see on the x-axis children's grade of acquisition of understanding of math equivalence. Um, what we did here, this is a discrete scale. Um, we looked at the first grade level in which children were able to solve at least one problem correctly, encode at least one problem correctly, which is we hold up a problem for five seconds, put it down, and they write what they think that they saw. Um, and then also to define the equal sign either explicitly relationally or to rate definitions uh, that are relational as at least smart. Um, so we looked at the first grade that they were able to do that and to maintain that understanding over time. If they demonstrated slightly higher understanding in second grade, they were labeled as advanced in second with a 1.5. If they demonstrated understanding on only one of those components, they were limited in their understanding in sixth grade with a 6.5. And then if they weren't understanding in sixth grade, um, they were a seven or not by sixth grade. So you can see this clear pattern here with the um, dependent variable of algebra readiness, uh, where earlier understanding of math equivalence matters. So uh, the rationale here, though, is all of these prior studies that have looked at relations between children's understanding of math equivalence and then later math achievement and algebra readiness have looked at symbolic understanding, but it's unclear how concrete understanding actually might predict later outcomes. So in this study, um, we looked at kids from second grade up through sixth grade, um, and I'm just going to skip right by that, um, but briefly measures, we had measures of symbolic math equivalence, concrete, um, we used the WJ applied problems for math achievement, um, and then algebra readiness had a standardized test in an interview, um, that was in sixth grade. Uh, for control variables, we looked at the WASI for IQ. We had a measure of calculation fluency, and we used a standard score from second to fifth grade for that. And then we also assessed reading fluency in fifth grade. Um, I'm not going to talk through, we've, we've heard from other talks kind of what solving and coding and defining equal sign is, but for this concrete um, task, uh, we asked children to figure out how many blocks need to go in the empty bin so that the ones on this side of the pink tent would be the same amount as the ones on the other side of the pink tent, and they had two of those problems. We also had problems where children needed to reason about an unknown quantity by relating two given quantities. So brief example, that Bob has nine dogs. If he gets two more cats, he'll have as many cats as dogs. How many cats does Bob have? So we'd read these two problems to them. They'd have to reason with that. Um, and then we had another verbal reasoning test um, from Sleeman and colleagues, where children were given a story with different characters and different amounts um, and needed to determine which character had more or do they have the same number. And then there was a transformation and they had to determine which character has more or do they still have the same number. Um, and then briefly, again, we have that standardized test in an algebraic reasoning interview, ask them, what does this variable stand for? And thinking about an equivalent equations problem where we tell them the value of n is um, that makes us true 17. And uh, if we add 27 to both sides, is this still true? And we ask them, which is more 3n or n plus 6? So all of these reasoning things. So what did we find? Um, predicting algebra readiness, readiness in sixth grade. Um, in an earlier study, we already demonstrated that symbolic understanding, that grade of acquisition, predicts algebra readiness. Uh, we also found here that concrete understanding is a significant predictor of algebra readiness in sixth grade as well. Um, so now what about math achievement? In this model, we did have an additional control of math achievement in second grade, um, which was taking up a lot of the variance there. Um, but even beyond that, children's concrete understanding of math equivalence in second grade was a significant predictor of their math achievement in fifth grade. Okay, so looking at uh, some discriminant validity, neither symbolic understanding or concrete understanding predicts reading fluency in fifth grade. And we know that each of these predict later math achievement and algebra readiness on their own. Um, but what about the unique effects? Um, so again, we're putting both in the model, predicting algebra readiness, um, both concrete and symbolic understanding contributed unique variants here. Um, and uh, if we look at math achievement, um, concrete understanding contributes unique variants. Uh, the, the symbolic understanding uh, was no longer significant, just a slightly lower 
um, variants that it's contributing there. Um, so just wrapping up quickly, um, we know that sort of we have evidence again that concrete understanding now predicts later math achievement and algebra readiness and both uh, are unique predictors of algebra readiness. Um, so with this knowledge, teachers might want to consider integrating pre-algebra content into early arithmetic or early elementary uh, math lessons. Um, and Liz touched on this concreteness fading idea that is one component that's helpful. Um, my colleagues and I recently published a paper in the NCTM practitioner journal that talks about this practice and some other evidence-based practices. Um, but again, this is not a causal um, study here, so we need future research to look at interventions and long-term impacts. Um, briefly want to acknowledge the funding from the National Science Foundation and members of the lab at Notre Dame, um, where we conducted this research, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Phew. Thank you, Carolyn. That was like <laughs> super quick. Um, I'm aware that some people already um, left and some might have to leave soon, um, but if you would be happy to answer some questions, if there are some. Um, yes, I, think, I can stay on, definitely. So do we have any questions for Carolyn or the others, I suppose? Um, so. I have to, I see there's a couple in the chat. I will um, link that paper, I, I have it on Twitter. Um, as well, and I'll uh, can find that link. Um, and I don't recall off the top of my head the correlation there, but I think it was maybe around 0.3 or 0.4. Um, it just sort of there. I think that's all of them. Um, may I ask a question? Thank you. That was an excellent talk. Um, really interesting results. I'm curious if you can speculate as to what are the different things that are being measured by the um, concrete and symbolic tasks? I mean, so when we say one is concrete and symbolic, that's a description of the tasks, but what are the differences in the skills that are being used to do the tasks in your view? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so all the symbolic tasks have, you know, that equal sign in there, um, either with solving or looking at it, writing down, or we're, we're showing them an equal sign, asking them what it means. Um, so I think all of that prior experience with arithmetic is really in children's mind when they're responding to those questions. Um, but with the with the blocks, there's no equal sign present and the, the word problems and the reasoning, thinking about these stories. Um, I think that that is, is, you know, kind of more of a, like a relational thinking type of uh, process and, and like, I guess, um, children kind of reasoning about their world that maybe we can even incorporate um, you know, I would hope, and 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 uh, uh, Bree Devlin and other colleague is looking at this kind of even with younger kids to kind of work in that type of understanding that that addresses it. Helena was also yeah. raising her hand. I think. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for a really, really nice presentation. Really interesting. Um, I have a question about the. It's, it's similar to David's question, actually, um, or it at least builds from it. Uh, I guess, I guess, to me, I'm wondering what concrete actually means. If you have word problems that involve, you know, verbal reasoning and 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 other things, I'm just wondering how concrete that is. And I guess I, it also made me think about the work of Jeff Bazance and Jody Sherman, who found that really kids don't have a whole lot of difficulty with concrete problems, at least concrete using concrete objects, right? Um, <clears throat> and their difficulty really stems from making the connection between the concrete and the symbol. So, so they their conclusion, as you know, was that it was really the symbolic understanding that they were lacking. Um, so I'm wondering, you had, um, I, I'm sorry if I missed it, but you had like uh, upper elementary kids, right? Grade five, grade six? Um, so we actually, I did go super quickly. Um, we measured the concrete understanding in second grade, and then we were predicting algebra readiness in sixth grade and math achievement in fifth. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, nevertheless, though, I still think that their study would, uh, would would argue that it's really it's really not the concrete, at least in defined that way or operationalized that way. Um, that that's the problem, really, right? It's the connection between the right. concrete and the symbol. So I'm wondering, like, what was the uh, what did the data look like at the second grade for the concrete? Like, was there how much variability was there? Was there was there uh, were there ceiling effects? Uh, can you can you um, 
Yeah, so that that's is uh, a great question. Um, um, from what I remember, um, there were the majority of children were able to do those mm -hmm. object uh, problems, you know, a lot, they're able to do those with the blocks right. and not performing as well, obviously on the symbolic problems. Um, but so, you know, there's, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 kids getting zero, 10 or 15 getting one and, and the rest of the 80 some students, um, getting both of those correct. Um, with the other ones, I, I think it was uh, fairly similar, the, the verbal reasoning for, for this analysis, we just looked at um, kind of, were they able to say that it was the same? And um, with the transformation, were they able to still understand it's the same? Um, we didn't look more in, in depth for this at their explanations. Um, so I think that'll really tease apart um, some of that as well. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it, it's kind of this connection between the two um, that we we need to try and, and right. help children with. Right. So there was some variability then is what you're saying. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Oh yes, and they do add, all, like when they're wrong, they mostly put all, like we give them a bag of blocks and right. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Other people can follow up later if they have questions. Okay. And if there are no more questions, um, thank you very much. It was a lovely symposium.